The show starts in three, two, one. And there goes that man's jacha. <laughs> oh my God, did you see that? <laughs> America's team? Yeah, right. Oh, baby, it's a big day in sports. There's nothing like battling it out with your teammates all season long to go win a championship. Green Bay's got it this year. Huge move for him. I think it's going to be a game changer. We have a lot to talk about this busy week in the sports world. Welcome to the In a League of Their Own podcast. The In a League of Their Own podcast is brought to you by Golf Kicks. Screw your shoes. Buy Canadips. Rep Sports. Buy Smooth My Balls. And buy Streamer Loot. Check out the In the League of Their Own merch line today. Welcome to the show. Let's see what Austin and Colin are diving into today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 95 of the In a League of Their Own podcast. Kicking us off on Monday's episode here, we have our number 95 sports fact. Taking us back to the 1984 NBA playoffs, Lakers legend Magic Johnson set an NBA record, notching 95 assists in a seven-game playoff series, which still holds today. And in this series, he also set a single-game playoff record, having 24 assists in one game against the Suns in the Western Conference Finals. So shout out to one of the best guards the league has ever seen. Magic Johnson. Moving then into the NFL here today. Um, I mean, you got to start things off. He's a bad man. Yeah. Uh, last night, Sunday Night Football, Mr. A-Rod um, winning a Sunday Night Thriller 30-28 uh, to 28 over the 49ers. Um, we didn't really talk much after the game last night. Uh, what what was kind of your takeaways from the game? Offense looks like our old offense um, scoring at will. Our defense, though, still a little shaky. We did give up a 17-point lead, which that shouldn't have happened at all. Um, it seems like our biggest weakness going all the way back to the NFC Championship game last year is right before halftime. Um, right before halftime is usually when our defense – for whatever reason, decides to lay an egg and we give up a touchdown, which is a huge momentum swing. Coming out the second half, 49ers score again, and it's a game again where we mm-hmm. just had a 17-point lead, one stop, and we put up another touchdown. And it's pretty much game over at that point. So um, Rodgers looked good. Um, you could really tell all the faith that he had in Mason Crosby after he spiked the ball and already was fist pumping before Crosby even came out on the field. Um yeah, it was a great game. Um, yeah, I just think we just need to tighten up still a little bit on the defense. Yeah, uh, they uh, surprisingly in their last because they're now two and two since I can't remember what it goes back to, but in the last four matchup against the 49ers. The 49ers won the last two or three going into tonight, and then the, with the win tonight, they even things up in that um, rivalry that has been built between the two teams over the past five to ten years here. Um, one thing that I was impressed with the defense, yes, they kind of – they allow the 49ers to get back into the game, but I was impressed with their run defense. Um, I don't know what they finished the night with as far as how many yards they gave up on the ground, but – It was 67. 67 yards? And the Niners gave up a hundred. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's a big thing there that over the past couple of years, Raheem Mostert dating back to Colin Kaepernick torching the Packers defense when he was still there. Um, and even in the 2019 NFC championship uh, run game as well, killed the Packers. So it's good to see them get out on that front. I mean, Debo Samuel stepped up, made two or three catches that are going to – are top plays of the week. Uh, George Kittle is going to get his touches uh, over the middle of the field, and he's a he's a tough guy that uh, after contact, he's going to get 5, 10, 15 more yards. He's not going to go down. Um, but, yeah, the defense, I guess, hung in there as much as they could. Um like you said, it sucks having a 17-0 lead, and then the next time Aaron Rodgers touches the ball, it's 17-14. 
Um, but yeah, he, him and Devontae pretty much took that game over. Um, and on that last drive, um, if you're San Francisco, you put, you got to put two or three guys on Devante, but they, they got it done 37 seconds too much for a rod. And now that's the third time in since I think 2014, that Pat, that Rogers has led a game winning drive in less than 40 seconds. Um, there's the Motown miracle back in it was 2015 or 2016 in Detroit. And then uh, in 16 against Dallas in the divisional round. And then now tonight or last night um, again. So, and then Crosby as well coming with that clutch gene. I can't remember the last time he missed a play, a, a kick in that situation, honestly. Um, I think when they, Actually, I, I think I do remember when they went on their two-year skid missing the playoffs, they Crosby missed a game-winning field goal against the Cardinals, and then McCarthy was fired the next day. I think was the last time, honestly, that um, Crosby missed a kick like that. So, yeah, it's huge to get, move to two and one. Uh, the rest of the NFC North still looking shaky. The Vikings did get a win yesterday, but they're only one and two now. And then – um obviously the Lions winless and the Bears one and two as well so the Packers have a game lead over the rest of the division as they head back home um to take on the Steelers uh next week so yeah huge win last night yeah I was just checking to see that Crosby it was back in 2017 when we lost to the Falcons when he missed the game in the first winning field goal no that was the last um playoff field goal you missed oh i was just thinking of a game winning the field first, goal. oh i don't know when that was <clears throat> she said the last field goal that he's missed in the playoffs was in 2017 against the falcons in the first quarter and that ended his streak at that time which he had the most he had the longest streak after 19 straight uh makes in the playoffs he this streak came to an end after that miss yeah i think what was it? Um, I think they showed a stat after the game that Crosby is 16 for 16. I was certain some certain stat when in less than two minutes left, his last 16 kicks, he's made all of them or something. I think that was Crosby, but, but yeah, nonetheless, Packers go home with a big win. Um, yeah, they definitely needed that one. So yeah, and then speaking about Devontae Adams, that hit that he got um took where they show the graphic where his eyes are in the back of his head and he was down on the field. A lot of people are calling into question the NFL's concussion protocol as he was back in the game immediately and there wasn't really any testing done or anything to see if he was okay. I mean, granted it worked out for us being Packer fans or whatever that he did catch two balls on that game winning drive, but like he went into the blue tent for two or three plays and came back out. So, yeah, but how fast can you? That's nowhere near long enough to tell for a concussion. Well, they do a couple of things, probably just cognitive and like fault, like just that kind of stuff. And apparently he passed it. Yeah, because a lot of people are calling into question because now um, people are going to see if he's going to be playing this week because concussions can't can show up a couple days after the fact or even 30, however long after the fact. And that's why a lot of people are calling into question the NFL's concussion protocols, especially that wasn't the only play this weekend where somebody was hitting in the head and then they were right back out there playing. And it's like, I thought that that was an emphasis they were supposed to, you know, try to take care of, but it seems like we're back to the old NFL where they don't really give a shit. Yeah. Yeah, like you said, it'll, it'll be interesting to see if he's misses any practices this week or if he's kind of taking things slow or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, that was interesting. Like you said, it played to our favor, obviously, to have him back in there. But, um, yeah, after being on the – laying on the field for two minutes. Because he was, like, knocked out. He was yeah. knocked out. Yeah. <laughs> I was surprised that freaking the um, – NBC allowed the camera to like even zoom in on a guy like that 
the angle that he had that was like on the field and he like perfectly between everybody's legs and was zoomed in right on his face as he was laying there. It's like, I don't think I've ever seen that before. It's like, usually it's from like up higher and you're just like, all oh, the guys down, but they showed like right into his face. And yeah, he, you could see, he was just like, <sighs> and it was like, all you could see was the white of his eyes. And it's like, Oh, it was, it was kind of scary to watch. Not gonna lie. Yeah, and looking at it, he only actually ended up missing one on-field snap before he was back. Yeah, because so, the, the, the pack because they took a it was like a third down or something. I think play clock was running down. Uh, Rogers took a timeout and then he came back in on that next play. Um, yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, and it's unfortunate for the guy that hit him too because. In it was like he he was like it was like his back in the back of his head is what hit him. It's like he got all the way turned around when he dove for the ball to where his back like ended hit the back of his helmet ended up like hitting him. And it's just he tried to avoid all you know obviously both players are going 100 miles an hour. You can't avoid all head contact, but yeah, at least trying to turn around because back in the day that would have been he would have been done because he would have been head hunted going going out for that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, last night too is interesting and kind of going off of week two with the refs just making so many questionable calls. Last night, it seemed like any contact that uh, a defensive player made with the receiver was getting called last night. They probably got the memo before the game from around the league like, hey, nothing was called today. We fucked up. You guys got to, you know, let's see a little bit more calls. Yeah. But, I mean, it seemed like it was favoring the 49ers a lot. But both, in the end, both sides got bullshit calls called on them. So, I mean, in the end, it ended up working out for the Packers. Uh, one That one, Adrian Amos, would have got them off the field, got a tripping call, which I think it's, it's funny that that's even a, like you're allowing guys – full grown men to run at each other and tackle each other at 20 plus miles per hour. But a guy can't stick his leg out and trip somebody on yeah, defense. We, we had seven penalties for 87 yards and they had four for 86. Yeah. Which three of those were put past interference for like big chunks for, yeah. cause I think out of that 86, 81 of it was past interference and they had one either delay a game or false start. So yeah, it'd be like 21 and a quarter yards a penalty is what they were averaging yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it it seemed like at the end it was kind of a packers versus the refs and 49ers at one point but um yeah they come out with the win either way um yeah moving on from sunday night uh some other news around the league here before we kind of dissect some of the games that happened yesterday Following the Chiefs-Chargers game, uh, head coach Andy Reid was taken to the hospital to be treated for dehydration. Um, probably threw an IV on him. Seen, uh, sources said he's okay now and he's back back home doing good. So um, said he was feeling ill after the game and didn't go to the press conference or anything and went straight to an ambulance that took him to the hospital. So seemed scary there for a bit, but just dehydrated probably in a, in a close gritty game like that probably forget to go over to the water table once in a while <laughs> yeah absolutely and then bring some other big news um coming around the league dallas cowboys right tackle al collins um is suspended after trying to bribe the league's drug test collector turns out um this has been an ongoing situation back since um von miller's infamous six game suspension for trying to bribe the the same guy um turns out that this guy is not the typical p collector this guy's got like gold chains and acts like he's like a baller and it turns out that other players have came forward and saying how this guy's like shady and sketchy about how he will take bribes and stuff from guys to like pass him and whatever Granted, players can't be suspended for marijuana anymore since the new CBA that the NFL passed this last season. But the issue was because he missed multiple tests. One, he had good reason as he was uh, attending a funeral for his grandfather. 
but the other ones you only have four hours from whenever they show up wherever they show up to piss um turns out he appealed his original suspension for five games and tried to get that drop down to two um they were originally going to negotiate and drop it down to two but then collins went behind everyone's back and contacted this drug piss test guy basically trying to work out a deal turns out the nfl found out about it and now they're saying no matter what this guy should at least be done five games at the minimum after Von Miller had six a couple years ago, um, September 10th, which was when um, announced his suspension wasn't going to be reduced. And turns out now that he got in all of this trouble, this guy's a huge, a huge guy for the Cowboys. He's played 62, 63 games. He hasn't really missed any time. He's huge on their O-line And now it turns out he has to forfeit $6.48 million of his injury guarantee in his salary this year and next season. And also $2 million he has to pay in fines. So he's no longer protected if he does get injured for the rest of the year due to failing a drug test. So it's going to be interesting to see how this whole situation works out because if you got a guy accepting dirty piss from a bunch of people, I, everybody's going to want to be seeing that guy. Yeah. Yeah, that's I, – I completely forgot about that with Von Miller a couple of years ago, and it's funny that this now resurfaced that – It's the same guy. Yeah, that's the same guy that he hasn't gone through some kind of protocol to, like, all right, dude, you're done unless you go through this to, like, clean your shit up and, like, stop doing this behind people's backs. So – um yeah, I mean, I guess props to the players trying to get any advantage they can, but at the same time, like, I don't know. It's it's funny how within every organization you think that they'd have clean-cut, hard-ass people that go in and get these drug tests, but then there's that one guy who's like, all right, I'll take it easy on you. <laughs> yeah, it's it turns out it's not each individual team that drug tests. There's a person in every single state that is a representative of the drug, whatever program. And that's how, no matter if you're on vacation, wherever they can get you, no matter where you go, because you have to let them know where you're going to be and all that stuff. So the only way Janikowski told Pat McAfee, this um, he's like, the only way to really get away is go on a cruise. He's like, what are they going to do? Land a helicopter on the ship. <laughs> that's true. That's yeah. Funny. And it was funny. Cause McAfee was talking about that on the show, actually. Um, last week he was just joke laughing, just basically like that's what I did. He's like, they, what are they gonna do? It's a good way to, you know, good couple of weeks to give yourself some time if you, you do got to clean yourself up. You go down to on the cruise, you go down to dinner and one night, and you look across the table from you, and there's the the drug test guy holds up a cup, and he's like, <laughs> "Gotcha, <laughs> gotcha, come over here, bud." <laughs> uh. Uh, yeah, going to some other news here. Uh, following a blowout loss for the Bears uh, yesterday against the Browns, head coach Matt Nagy says that all three quarterbacks are now on the table. Um, who do you think deserves a nod next week against the Lions? Nick Foles, big Nick Nick. Give him a rip. Let him see what he can do. You've seen what Dalton is capable of, which is he can play some football still. Justin Fields. You still have no, nobody has no clue what you're going to get from him yet. Um, A lot of question marks surrounding him when a lot of people thought that, yeah, get him in the game. Let's see what he can do. And no, he's not the guy who is NFL ready right now. Um, And Nick Foles, guy who just won a Super Bowl and then he hit the bench. So (laughs) let's see if he's still got what it takes to carry a team because that's what he's known for is stepping in and just filling those holes. Yeah, and in credit to Justin Fields' first NFL career NFL start, he had six passes for 68 yards, but also took nine sacks for 67. So he netted one passing yard on the day. So um, kind of watching him again, he you could tell he's a rookie quarterback, not going through his progressions, um, not doing his checks pre-snap to pick up uh, pick up blitzes and stuff. 
But at the same time, his offensive line didn't help him, um, letting him get sacked nine times. And in that game, Miles Garrett setting a franchise record four and a half sacks in one game. So a um, couple of weeks after Ch- uh, Chandler Jones had a five sack game, Miles Garrett pretty much matches him with a four and a half sack game. Yeah. And the Bears only having 47 total yards on offense. Um, you ain't going to win any games getting that. No. And then as well, speaking of Miles Garrett, he actually was uh, trolling the the Bears in his postgame press conference when he was asked, like, how easy was it out there today? Whatever. And he's just like, obviously, it's not easy playing in the NFL, but he goes, it was very confusing how we were getting to him all day long and they weren't adjusting any pressures, any protections, nothing. He's like, all we had a field day. Everybody had a field day all day today. <laughs> it was like – in the NFL, that's surprising that their coaching staff or fields didn't change anything. They basically let them get hit all game long. Mm-hmm. And it always makes you wonder, too, if the Bear, I mean, Matt Nagy is already one of the coaches on the hot seat going into this year. Makes you wonder, against the Lions next week, you had Andy, Dal- Andy Dalton in there who, who – Honestly, he's probably the better of the three so far, it looks like. Is he going to be back 100% with his bone bruise? Yeah, that's that's a big question. And then you got Justin Fields, who's supposed to be one of the best quarterbacks out of this previous draft class. If he plays, that's an L. Mm-hmm. And then Foles, you don't, Super Bowl knows. MVP, nobody knows. won a Super Bowl. But, like, you have all these guys at your disposal. And if you go against the Lions next week, who – are essentially one or two plays away from being a two and one team, almost getting wins against the 49ers and yesterday against the Ravens. Um, the, the Lions are 0 and 3, which makes them look bad on paper, but they're not a bad team this year. So I don't know. Matt Nagy, he's more and more on the hot seat uh, as these weeks go on here for the Bears. Um, yeah. Yeah. Also, speaking of hot seats. Urban Meyer, um, you go and you look at that Jags Cardinals game yesterday. The Jacksonville Jaguars were up thirteen to seven, and then they were up nineteen to seven before the storm broke. Um, you have a hundred nine yard kickoff return for a touchdown, which ties an NFL record. You have a lot of momentum. I mean, how do you let this game get away? And real question is. Trevor Lawrence looking at his stats again, two picks. I mean, I forgot what they were saying on television yesterday, but you go back, there's three, he's the third quarterback now in NFL history to start his first three games and have two or more picks in every single game. One was, uh, I think it was Elway. I think it was Elway. And then the other one was, um, fuck they're both hall of fame quarterbacks <laughs> yes they're both hall of fame quarterbacks i forgot who the other one was i want to say aikman but i don't think it was aikman it was somebody else i want to say but yeah i don't know i mean i guess if you're lawrence that gives you some hope as to oh these guys had a rough start to their career too but at the same time I feel like both – I feel like Elway – I mean, back then he had a really good defense to bail him out. The Jags obviously don't have that. It was Troy Aikman and Peyton Manning, excuse me. Oh, so it was Aikman. Okay. Yep, Aikman and Peyton Manning. Yeah, I mean, the Cardinals, 2-0. and Coming in, you have a chance to beat them. Like, those are wins you need to turn your franchise around and – yeah, they're up 19 to 7 and they lose 31 to 19. So they allow what is that? 24 unanswered points. And in that division, if they would have gotten a win, they would have been in second place tied with the Texans, who don't have a quarterback right now. So they're looking for second place in the division. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um I guess one more injury to throw out there before we kind of can start breaking down these games from yesterday. Uh, Giants linebacker and former Packer Blake Martinez out for the rest of the year with a torn ACL. 
huge hit to that defense, let, has led their led that defense and tackles since he's been on that Giants squad. Um, I mean, Giants took two L's yesterday. <laughs> yeah, other news as well. Panthers first round pick corner J.C. Horn is out for the year. Um, so they just signed C.J. Henderson and a fifth round pick from the Jacksonville Jaguars for Dan Arnold. The UW Platteville guy. They sent him down to Jacksonville. Yep. He's now on the Jacksonville Jaguars. So he should be the number one guy down there. Yeah. I mean, on Thursday night, he looked he looked good. He had a couple good catches. Um, and obviously the Jags, I don't even know who the tight end is now. I mean, they had Tebow, who isn't even worth mentioning because he got he had caught in pre or in uh training camp, but um yeah. Oh, James White as well. Um, his status is still up in the air after he was carted off with a hip injury. They're still not sure. The team still hasn't updated um, anything on what's going on with him. But that'd be a huge loss to that New England offense if he's out for an extended period of time as Mac Jones continues to have his rookie struggles. And granted, it's not even mostly him that's screwing up. It's the $180 million that Bill Belichick just spent this whole offseason. All those guys are getting penalties, dropping balls, fumbling. Yeah. Like, it's not even Mac Jones. You really can't say it's on him. <laughs> no. Yeah, you, when, when you have a rookie quarterback, you have to have the other 10 guys in that offense rally around him and help him out when he's struggling and they're all not playing very good football. Yeah, and I guess two more things that we forgot to mention. Colts guard Quentin Nelson, after he comes back, he exited the game with an ankle injury. Um, he needed more time, obviously to rehab and get better. And then a big loss for the Tennessee Titans, AJ Brown goes out with a hamstring in that game versus the Colts too. So um, those are huge losses for those guys and those teams. It's going to be interesting to see what happens, especially looking at this. I guess we can wait to to talk about that once we break down the games. Yeah. But I mean, if that's, the Titans losing a big guy, the Colts losing a big guy, who are the top two teams in the AFC South. The Texans are kind of keeping pace. The Jags. The Jaguars are right there. There are a couple wins from potentially being right at the top. Yeah. Which would be insane if the Jacksonville Jaguars ended up winning the AFC South. Yeah. I mean, nobody would saw that coming. Whatever the, <laughs> whatever the odds are, whatever the odds would have been on that – Pre uh, preseason, somebody's gonna make a ton of money off of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess kind of breaking down some of our game or games from yesterday. Um, circling back to the Chargers Chiefs game, uh, one of the early games. Chargers go into Kansas City and get a big dub, thirty to twenty four. Uh, Mahomes struggled again, two weeks in a row, throwing two picks. Um, the no look throw. Uh, starting to kind of bite him in the ass. That first, that first in- interception uh, threw it a touch high for his receiver, and then Asante Samuel, uh, the rookie, got his second pick on the year. I was gonna say that wide receiver did get his hands on the ball, though. Granted, it was a little high, but instead of him standing flat-footed and putting his arms up, he could have jumped and made that easy catch. Granted, that no throw part of it, he probably wasn't even fucking expecting the ball to be coming to him. So that's where that miscommunication was. He should have had it, but you can't really blame him if he didn't know the ball was coming. Mm -hmm. And plus, that's like look looking at that play. The closest defender is five plus yards away. Mahomes can set his feet, turn, look at him. Hey, the ball's coming your way. Easy completion. You're in the red zone. Or he even could have put it in his left hand and pitched it. Mm Hmm. You know, he or his under throw, whatever the fuck he could have, he could have got him the ball. Yeah, but nonetheless, um, that Chargers defense got four turnover turnovers on the, on the day. Those two interceptions and two fumbles, one by Edward Delaire and the other by Tyreek Hill. Um, in a game that they were really outmatched offensively, Ch- Chiefs beat them for total yards. But um, yeah, Chargers were resilient. Again, the Chiefs are one of those teams that can put up 21, 28 points in the quarter in a blink, um, which they did kind of make headway coming back. They put up, what was it, 
Yeah, 14, 14 points coming out of halftime in the third quarter was their biggest quarter. So, um, yeah, nonetheless, the Chiefs, bottom of the AFC West right now. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, the Chargers, that's why I picked them. I'm, they're one play away from all from being 3-0 as well. Um yeah, Chiefs, they have tough sledding this year in the AFC. Um, it's not going to be easy like they may have thought. Granted, they put themselves in bad positions. Their defense fell apart late in the game where Herbert multiple times on fourth down converted, and then they gave up the touchdown late at the end of the game. Props to the Chargers for staying aggressive too, not settling to take a field goal, scoring a touchdown, and daring – Mahomes to try to lead lead a rush down the field, knowing that your defense has been on them all game long. You, they knew that they were going to stop them basically. So, shout out to the Chargers, and yeah, they're going to be a wrecking. They're they're a crew. They are they're a team that's got a top top offense and top defense. Um, yeah, I think they're going to have a lot of my picks going forward. Yeah, I really like the Chargers going to that game as well. The, I really only gave the Chiefs an edge just for being at home. Had the game been in L.A., I would have picked the Chargers all day. And now going into whenever the Chiefs do come to L.A., that that should give the Chargers that much more juice to, hey, we went and beat them in Kansas City. We got to beat them at home. To For any team in that AFC West to be able to sweep the Chargers on the year or the, the Chiefs on the year, um, you're putting yourselves in, in a really good spot. And they don't play them until week because there's 18 now, correct? 18 weeks, yeah. 18, 17. Week 15. So the Chiefs got a lot of time to, to settle down, find out who they are, and get going. So um, this could be another shootout the next time these two, two teams meet. Mm-hmm. And even in the a- AFC West as well, the, the Chargers aren't the only team the Chiefs have to worry about. The Broncos are 3-0 and all, given that – the three teams they have beat are combined 0-9, so we'll have to wait until they play a winning team to figure out what they're made out of. But then the Raiders uh, as well, they stay undefeated yesterday. That's going to be another team that AFC West that the Chiefs are going to have to uh, prepare for. Um, I guess moving on here, uh, we'll move past the, Char- the Cardinals, Jags, and Bears-Browns game since we kind of already talked about those. Uh, going into one of the early games yesterday, uh, Bills, Washington, um, another another outing for Josh Allen, four TDs on the day, 43-21 final there. Um, Should have six. Should have had six touchdowns. Yeah. Um, who was it? Uh, Emmanuel Sanders had a day, two, two touchdowns. Um, really shared the wealth between a, a lot of guys yesterday. Uh, yeah, Beasley 98, Sanders 94, Dig 62, tight ends were getting 49, 31, and 23. So, yeah, spreading the ball around. Trubisky, we got the game. Um, yeah, how, how, do, how do you think it feels to be Mitch Trubisky at this point? <laughs> I mean, one, one completion for one yard. Um, and I mean, teams two and one. Yeah. And you're seeing the Bears in distress. Yeah, it's got to be good for him. Again, kind of a similar situation as to how Jared Goff has talked about moving from L.A. to Detroit. It's nice to be in a place where you're wanted. Uh, seems like Trubisky is kind of – his whole personality has changed since he went to Buffalo. He seems happier. He's, he's ha- I mean, you're on a winning squad for one, so that helps to kind of boost your confidence too. But, um, yeah, the Bills are really that lone team in the AFC East right now as – Everybody else is kind of <clears throat> everybody else is kind of struggling right now, and then I guess a quick point on Washington football team um, that offense again. Uh, t- Taylor Heineke, I mean he's doing what he can. That they couldn't get the run game going yesterday. I don't even know if they got over a hundred. Yeah, that not even a hundred yards. It looks like um, seventy eight yards on the ground for Washington yesterday. Um, yeah, and the. I don't know. They, they just every time they had the ball, it didn't look look like they were getting anything going. Given that they uh, did score two touchdowns in the second quarter to kind of make it close, to make it uh, 27-14 going into halftime. 
Um, but then they come on lay a goose egg in the third quarter. Um, yeah, it's just it's tough for them. But again, Washington being in that NFC East, pending what the, the Cowboys are gonna do tonight, um, <laughs> they're they're right there with it. Oh, Cowboys yeah. and Eagles, so yeah. Um, obviously when your run game's not going, you it's gonna be tough to get a win. And then when your passing game isn't going either, um that Bills defense is pretty good, especially in their secondary. Um yeah, it tough game for Washington. I I don't think the, the I don't even really think they expected to win. Obviously, you know you can go out there and try, but at the end of the day, playing against the Bills at Buffalo against Josh Allen, their defense is really good. You got Heineke, who's you know, who's your quarterback off of this is his second week now with the team again after offseason. I don't think this is, I don't think that, that if anything, this was a learning experience for Heineke and the whole team, the whole Washington football team, as they are pretty young, um, tighten up that defense. And like you said, see what the Eagles and the Cowboys do tonight. Uh, moving over into a, an AFC South uh, matchup yesterday, Titans, uh, after starting 0-1, uh, went on the road in Seattle last week to get the win and come home and get things done against the Colts 25 16. And the Colts are now tied with the Jags at the bottom of the NFC South as they moved to 0 3, as Mr. Two Sprains couldn't get it done yesterday. Um, he struggled, didn't get over 200 yards passing the ground game as well, couldn't get over 100 yards. Um, and Derrick Henry, 113-yard day, day to be expected. Uh, really, this game should have been a th- three- or four-possession game. Tannehill, two picks, kind of kept the Colts in the game there for a while. Um, but in the end, you hand the ball off to, to Derrick Henry, play that time of possession. Um, Titans had the ball for almost 10 minutes more. Uh, yeah, not a whole lot to say about the game except for – Titans did what they expected to do with Henry and the Colts are still trying to figure out if Carson Wentz is going to be it for him, especially with his injuries that kind of hinders them as well. I'm surprised that they only gave Jonathan Taylor 10 carries and then their other running back six carries. They only gave 16 runs the whole entire game out of, out of 57 plays. So they're tr- putting the ball too much in two sprains hands. Um, and I, I honestly, I picked the Titans to win this one, but there was a point in this game where I was like, if the Colts just run the ball down their throats, kill all the time, Tennessee's going to have, Tannehill's going to have to pull out some out of his ass if they want to win the game. Mm-hmm. But they chose to not do that. And oh, man, I was laughing my ass off yesterday. Pat McAfee he was posting on Instagram videos of some of the some of the clips during the games, and it was like watching this man is the most savage thing that there is. Like literally the the craziest thing that there is to watch. And then he was just like laughing, like "Oh my god!" Like I can't believe this guy does this. <laughs> and then there was a stat that came up since 2017, I think it was. Carson Wentz has been the most hit quarterback in the entire league by I think it was by like 13 or 14. So he's getting his piss pounded out of him. I can't believe he even played. He didn't do much. He didn't, he, he didn't really help them. No. Um, this Colts team is in trouble. Hard knocks. Is this going to be a hard knocks of an own 17 season? <laughs> yeah. Going back to their run game again, Jonathan Taylor, six, six and a half yards to carry Naheem Hines, 4.2 yards to carry. You average out the entire game. You could literally not pass the ball the entire game and get a first down in two or three plays all game. Keep shoving it down their throat. Defense is going to get tired, but they put the ball in one's hands um, and barely, uh, yeah, right around fifty percent on the day. So not not even completing barely half of his passes. But um, yeah, it seemed like Taylor was chunking them down the field. All, all game and then Heem Hines with um, 
the nice touchdown run off the left left side uh, watching the game yesterday too. It seemed like just get the ball in your running back's hands and they decided to go the other route. Yeah, Derrick Henry with all the mileage that he has on him had 12 more carries than both combined running backs in the Colts yesterday. And the Colts yeah. running backs are young. I don't know why they're not using them. No, I, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, moving on then to the next game, Saints-Pats. Uh, Saints bounce back after getting harassed by the Panthers last week, getting the win on the road, 28-13 in New England. Um, again, smothering that young Mac Jones, who had three interceptions on the day. Um, Which literally none of them are his fault. <laughs> They all were tip balls. Oh, yeah, that's right. Literally zero of his interceptions. And I honestly think all season long, all of his picks have been tipped, dropped balls, or or like none of them, I want to say, are his fault all season long. It's all those guys that they brought in who are literally letting their team down. Mm -hmm. In which, looking at the rushing, which, again, leads to their loss on the day, Mac Jones led the team with 28 yards rushing. Um. Which is atrocious. James yeah, James First White. Play. Yeah. But, um, yeah, not the receivers, um, I mean, they had two of them right, right around 100 yards on the day. So, it, on paper, it looks like their passing attack was decent. But, again, those three interceptions, um, you lose by 15. You give up three interceptions. You turn all three of those into, into scoring uh, drives. You got yourself a game. So, um, even though on paper, it looks like Jones is struggling. Uh, like you said, it seems like most of his past, like he's got good ball, ball placement. It's just his receivers and are not helping him at all. Yeah. It's like they're 1% away from like clicking all the way. It's like they're having these little missteps on like every play where it's like one to 2% is off. And it makes the whole play off where the old saying is it's better for all of us to be wrong than one person to be right. Cause everybody's on the same page doing the same thing. Then one person doing the complete wrong thing and then it fucks up the whole entire play. So yeah, Mac Jones, I'm, I mean, people had him as the favorite for rookie of the year. I, I personally think that, him and Jamar Chase are right there, one and two. I was just about to say Jamar Chase. Um, four touchdowns to his first three games. The only other receiver to do that, Randy Moss in his rookie season. Um, and he did that with Tommy for the Pats. Mm -hmm. Or no, fuck, Randy Moss went to was on the Vikings. D D Dante Culpepper would have yeah. been back but then. still a huge arm. Um and, yeah, I mean, before we get over to that game, just going to give a shout-out to my boy Jameis. 13 for 21. Granted, he's not throwing for 500 yards a game, but he did have two touchdowns, no picks. Uh, he managed the game very well. Yeah, then we'll, I guess, jump into that game talking about Jamar Chase. Bengals go on the road, get the win 24 to 10 against the Steelers. Um, Knew that was coming. Yeah, ben, ben struggled again despite 318 yards through the air. Had two picks. Just look, I saw this, there's the one video of him just doing a check down pass, trips over his own feet and just falls face first into the ground. He just, I don't know. I mean, the, the, Pittsburgh's respecting that the guy, Hall of Fame quarterback, wants to stick it out, but he's hurting that team more than he's helping them by sticking around this long. Honestly, he should have retired two years ago, realistically. Like, he, he's going to be a Hall of Fame quarterback no matter what. But you put yourself on a higher pedestal if you retire two years ago versus kind of what he's done over the past two years. Um, in this game, uh, Juju Smith-Schuster left the game early. And then at the end, Chase Claypool went out with an injury. So they're two really top um, receivers. Was yesterday Najee Harris, 14 catches, 102 yards. Um, had 142 yards total uh, uh, of offense. So... Um, yeah, they only ran the ball He's, 14 times yesterday. Yeah. It's slow. They're they're having Ben stand back there and throw fucking 60 times a game. Yeah, 58 move, yesterday. Dude. And it's like, gee, what do you expect this guy? He's like a wince in this situation. Mm -hmm. 
Like he's getting the fucking shit beat out of him. And honestly, it looks like he doesn't want to be, it looks like this team with how many people are hurt, all these people, all the three rookie linemen. It, it just looks like he's fucking done. <laughs> like mm-hmm. it, I don't I don't know. Um, Preseason. It looked like, again, the Bengals are going to struggle, but I'm, I'm saying Pittsburgh has a four or five win season. They're going to be at the bottom of the AFC North. I think the Bengals got a chance to at least not take last in this division this year. Um, yeah, they, they have a chance. I don't think Pittsburgh's going to be that bad. Obviously, they're going to be way better when they get their nine starters all back on defense. That's huge that they're out. Um, and who knows how much Roethlisberger's pecs, you know, affected him. Are we going to see him sit out a game and let Dewey Haskins take over and see what he's got? I mean, they have no apparent heir backup quarterback in this position because all their money is on Ben to get him mm-hmm. through one more season. So, I mean, they beat the Bills week one. So Ben can clearly win a game, take the hits, make plays. I feel like your defense, when you're not able to be on the field and when you're down, you kind of have to throw the ball. And they didn't have the luxury at all, really, to run to run the ball, seeming as they only had 14 care. You're down 14-0 to start the game. Mm-hmm. Um, you got to throw the ball. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he did what he could. I feel like he's just – that offense looks discombobulated, and then when you have all those guys out on defense, you really don't have a chance against a team in Joe Burrow that is capable of sc- – almost scoring every time that they go down the field, they're becoming really efficient. Yeah. And look at kind of at the, the stats on the game. I mean, if you literally went off team stats, you would think that the Steelers won this game by a landslide. 342 yards of total offense versus 268, more passing yards, um, more first downs, nine for 19 on third down versus the Bengals three for nine, uh, 77 total plays versus the Bengals 42, punted one last time. Um, 11 more minutes of time of possession. You'd look at that and think, oh, the Steelers ran away with this. No, they only put up 10 points on offense. That They just they couldn't complete drives. Um, again, Ben's two picks. You turn around and put turn those two into touchdowns, you have a, you have a tied game. So, um, but yeah, again, but I feel like the Steelers got to – move on Mason Rudolph or Dwayne Haskins are kind of, you got to see what they're made of. Cause as soon as big Ben's gone, he's already making, losing your team football games. You're going to take a step down from that even more. If you don't get the right guy in there under center um, once he's gone, because if big, if big Ben does any, ju- does any justice to that team, he, he leaves after this year. He has to. Yeah, these next four games are going to be true tests of some pretty solid defense. Packers, Broncos, Seahawks, Browns are the next four teams that they play, all of which are playing pretty good football right now. I'd I'd say the biggest question mark out of all those teams is the Seahawks at this point. Um, Packers defense, you don't know what you're going to get, but our secondary is pretty good. So him throwing the ball a lot is chances for more interceptions. Um, but is our run defense going to be able to do what we did against San Francisco? Granted, San Francisco had two of their running backs that weren't even able to play as well. So mm-hmm. it seems like the last few times we did play the 49ers, they were a little bit more banged up than we were in some of the positions that really do matter. Granted, we, a win's a win, so we're going to take it. But that is a question mark yet again for how well we did do with shutting down the run games. They really only had one guy to feed all game long. who's probably pretty fucking tired. Yeah. Um, moving on then um, again, kind of a, one of the more boring games, uh, the Owen two versus Owen two team uh, Falcons go on the road to New York, get their first one in the year, 17, 14. Um, a game that was seven to six going into halftime uh, ceremony. Yeah. Um, Giants didn't get e- Eli a win on Eli day. Uh, Daniel Jones. I mean, despite not having a touchdown on the day, didn't throw an interception either. So he, he was okay. Uh, Barkley has got to step up only 51 yards on 16 carries. Um, he did have a touchdown. 
Yeah, he did. Yeah, had one touchdown. Um, yeah, the Falcon. It was it was a resilient game for the Falcons. Matty Ice stepped up, got his two touchdowns on the day. Um, it's another game where you look at the stats and you'd think the Giants won. Mm-hmm. Especially with the. Um, uh, what was I looking at? Oh, where'd it go? I can't find it. I was looking at a certain stat that I was like, oh, the Giants should have won this game. Whatever. I can't find yep, it. Scored them in total yards, passing yards, rushing yards, yards per play, first downs, total plays. Yeah, I mean, across runs, the board. And t- three minutes of time of possession. Their penalties hurt them. They did have eight for 53 yards. So those could have been in critical situations. I didn't really watch that game too much. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, watching NFL Red Zone, they didn't really go to that game a whole lot. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Falcons go on the road, get a win. I mean, good for them to kind of stay. I mean, I don't know. As much as you, it's like you get a, you get a three point win against a Giants team that hasn't been good for a couple of years. Um, I mean, a win's a win, but Falcons shouldn't hang their hat on that one too much. Yeah, I mean, they are technically dead last, but they're not on three. Yeah. So. Uh, moving on then to an NFL record setting game here. Uh, Baltimore Ravens go on the road to Detroit, get a win 19, 17, uh, a game that really the lions kind of dominated the whole time. Um, they Baltimore really couldn't get anything going, uh, after having a, a 10, nothing lead going into halftime, the lions really dominated the second half. Uh, Jared Goff. Um, again, no touchdowns on the day, but no picks. Um, I don't know. It, it was one of those weird games that coming down to the end, you thought that the Lions would have it, but their defense just didn't help them whatsoever. It let Baltimore convert on a fourth and 19. Jackson standing at his own five yard line, uncorks it down the field to Sammy Watkins to get them into what for any other team would not be field goal range would be setting up a Hail Mary play. Um, and then kind of a, a, a miscue by again, the refs this year, the clock running down hits all zeros for at least one, two seconds. Lamar snaps it, throws it out of bounds to get the play clock or to get the game clock down to two seconds so that Justin Tucker can come in. Um, should have been a delay game. Knocks it back to 71 yards, which is not a field goal that you would even try. And you make Lamar Jackson come out and try to throw a Hail Mary. Um, and they're one of the worst passing offenses in the league. So Lions should have won that game. Um, but I mean, I guess hats off, hats off to Justin Tucker, 66 yard field goal to win the game, new NFL record. Um, well deserved. Easily the best kicker right now um, in the league. So Baltimore moves to two and one to stay relevant in the AFC North, and the Lions unfortunately stay under um, winless on the year. Yeah. Um, looking back on it, I just wanted to, to talk a little about that. The ref after the game ended up commenting commenting on the matter saying as far as our mechanics the back judge is looking at the play clock and if it were to hit zero he sees the zero and then he looks at the ball to see if the ball is being snapped if the ball is being snapped they let the play go if it's not moving that's a delay of game so those are the mechanics that is applied through all referees so he could have taken a, a look and by the time he did take t- one second's fast as shit, dude. So you take one second to look and you turn back and that ball's moving, you let the play go. So Mm -hmm. they said if it were obviously the ball not moving at all, or if it was like significant, somebody would have buzzed in and they immediately would have blown the play dead flag would have came out and it would have been reset. So um, there is a little bit of leeway, I guess, when it does come to delay of game and that's, I mean, I, I think that should be okay. You're double-checking that what you're seeing 
is the same as how it's supposed to be. So mm -hmm. I guess it's just a fail safe that allows human a chance for error. You know, we yeah. are, you know, they're human. Yeah. Which I mean, that happens a handful of times every single game where the clock hits zero and maybe a, a tenth or two seconds go by, ball snaps. But like, I don't know. This this was an instance where it's like 1001, 1002 ball snaps to where it seemed it seemed like the longest like uh time between zeros on the clock, which that makes sense if like the ref looks away, there's two seconds on the clock, hits zero looks back the clock has been at zero for half a second then takes a second to look at the ball the ball's starting to move that's a second or two that go by to where i mean that that's probably exactly what happened is it's just a matter of he looked at the clock play clock when it was at zero but it was at zero for a second by the time he looked at it so yeah it says that there's a 1.6 second leeway before there's some sort of buzz that comes down. But they added, they preferred, they said that the, what would, the, that, which is a great idea. The, the ref said, what would remove all uncertainty as far as keeping it exactly the same would be like the NBA. Once it hits zero, a loud buzzer goes through the whole arena and it's a delay of game penalty, not to where it's so, so many different things have to go on as far as checking the clock, looking to see if the ball is moving, and then calling it as far as mm -hmm. it hits zero. Bah, you don't even have to worry about checking if the ball is moving or not. Yeah, because that's a play, too. Again, converting on a fourth and 19, everybody's running off. The chains are trying to move. They're trying, like, all that's going on at one time. That's just one extra component for the refs to worry about. Or, like you said, if they did it to assemble like an NBA thing to where – the refs can focus on is the ball in the right spot is the chain crew up is everybody is the defense up, on the right side of the ball is the offense in a legal formation like these are all things that go through the ref's head on top of that oh is a play clock at zero like i just go back to think though how many times would be changed how many games would be changed due to that loud buzzer because there's so many snaps i can just count back in my head of rogers taking the snap right as it's zero literally zero taking the snap where it would be eh, delay of game penalty and the play wouldn't have even happened. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, I mean, I, 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 would, I would hate for a computer like to be a loud buzz. I would hate that to, to be in the stadium and then hear that. And then the ball gets snapped and then everybody's like, what the fuck's going on? You know, where I feel like it'd have to be something that the refs can hear, not the whole stadium. Cause that would be, obnoxious <laughs> or it should be a play that's reviewable you know yeah. by, the, by the booth mm -hmm. deal goes good at the end mm -hmm. of the game if we're unsure as to how long it was after the fact let's go take a look at it if it obviously was a little bit longer than what we expect as the nfl referee or average of all the other times that it is if it's longer than that you should overturn the call if it's under that you should stick with it you know there should be some sort of rule instead of just the ref's discretion yeah well I'm going into this year too the proposal that the the ravens suggested to the nfl of having a ref upstairs to if there's a blatant call on like a holding or on the back end like last night the that uh blow to the head on Devonte adams the the back judge was just in a bad spot to where he's supposed to be downfield watching that happen ahead of him the D backs and Devontae Adams got behind him to where he was seeing behind the play to where somebody upstairs would be like, Oh, that's a hat. That's helmet to helmet contact or somebody upstairs. Oh, the clock was at all zeros or there was a holding penalty that got missed. Um, obviously you don't want to, that slows down the game if you're doing it all well, the time. Do refs but, well, they got to manage the game guy. on the field. Well, you need one guy. All you need is one guy out there if you have a camera seeing everything and just telling you what to call on every play. Well, yeah, there's discretion. Like, like I said, you're going to slow down the game if you call every single thing, but the blatant things that are like 60,000 people saw it, but because a ref was a one step to the right or the left and didn't see it. Like, I don't know. That's sports. I, I love it. Human error is allowed to happen. Well, yeah, but. And the like that play against Devontae Adams last night, human error could also 
like that gets people hurt. <laughs> if well, clearly it, he wasn't hurt. Well, we don't know that yet, but well, I don't he know. wasn't at the time because he came back on the field. Well, yeah. I don't know. Like I said, I don't want him to come on come in and play call everything, but as a whole, they need to have somebody say, Oh, that was blatant, that got missed. We need to review that. At least take a look at it. They don't well, have to the rep, well, they the, got one guy that's watching all the games in New York, and that's what they have in place. Well, yeah, but they they only do that if the coach challenges it. He's not going to come from New York and say, "Hey, you guys missed well, this. You got to look at it." They have booth reviews on scoring plays and inside two minutes. And they review down. everything. Yeah. I mean, but, they do have a, a procedure in place. It's just not. I don't know. Like you don't want to take too too much away, like you said, you don't want to be calling too much. But then, but there's things that get missed that shouldn't get missed. <laughs> like the like the human error of the game, fine. Like I like I don't. You allow the couple tenths of a second on like a delay of game to allow a play to get off. That's fine. Like, but the misplays that can completely turn the game around, like like that one yesterday of the Lions should have won that game, but I don't know. It's tough because if you, if you implement something like that, it's like, where do you draw the line of, Oh, we will let that go, but we won't let this go. Cause there's a holding on every play that they could call it every single play. Yeah. So it's like pass interference. There's almost pass interference on every single play, you know, they could call shit every single play if they really wanted to. As far as there has to be a flow of the game or you're not going to get people to watch because then it's going to turn into baseball and games are five hours long. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I said, like nothing, not, every single play shouldn't get reviewed as to all, like you said, as a holding or pass interference on every single play. But game-changing plays, like again, the line should be one and two because of a missed call. Well, um, any penalty could be a game-changing play on that play situations are situational yeah i don't know i guess just in this instance it's like i guess i don't care because it's like imagine if that happened to the packers you'd be sitting here pissed off you know what i yeah. mean yeah and what i mean what else can you do about it though yeah like as a as a- you look at the Lions' stats they were three for ten on third down in the red zone they were one for seven scoring touchdowns so they left points that you know they left a lot of points out there where one more field goal and they would have won yeah or their defense makes one more stop they would have won that fourth and 19 how do you how do you let them convert that Mm -hmm. you know like it shouldn't have gotten to that point you know what i mean but it did heat of the moment shit fucking going on people yelling screaming I don't know. That's sports. Yeah. Uh, let's see. You're moving on. Uh, Broncos again moved to three and zero on the year. Shout out the Jets, twenty six to nothing. Zach Wilson, another two picks on the day. Kind of a boring game to watch, honestly. Um, yeah, no touchdowns for Teddy. Two gloves. Yeah. I don't know. Like we, like you we said, they lead. They're the top of the AFC West right now, but. Take it with a grain of salt because the the teams that they beat are zero nine on the year. So their defense is up to par. It's their offense that's the question mark. Mm-hmm. And then just like for the Panthers as well, being three and zero, their defense is pretty freaking good. Their offense is the question mark when you play a good team because the Saints they wasn't even the Saints team that they played. No. Um. Moving on to the only overtime game yesterday, uh, the Raiders stay perfect on the year with a 31-28 win uh, to kick a field goal through to, in the um, to end overtime. Uh, Jacoby Brissett stood in, did, I mean, honestly played, played good. better than you have seen Tua play recently in some games. Um, Mike Kosicki had a day, 10 catches for 86 yards. He was kind of... Um, him and Brissett were really the only two keeping that offense going. Um, 
on the other side, uh, with um, Josh Jacobs out, Peyton Barber steps in, 23 carries for 111 yards on the day. Young man had himself a day. Uh, and that Raiders, that Raiders defense steps up when when they need to. Derek Carr can drive drive them down and get a touchdown in a, a handful of plays at any given moment. Um, but I mean, yeah, hats off to the Dolphins again, converting on a long what was it, fourth and sixteen or something to get to keep the game alive. It was yeah, some, Dolphins went three for four on fourth down. Yeah, which I mean, yeah, again, yeah. hats. Raiders defense, the Raiders got lucky. I want to say, I'm just going to say that they had eight penalties for 104 yards. They didn't deserve to win the game. However, they ended up winning 31 28 with that field goal in overtime. Um, just the way that the game went all game long, it just looked like the Dolphins were going to pull it out. And then, yeah, I don't know. Because Derek Carr didn't even look that great compared to his usual. Yeah. I mean, you take away this one pick that that could have been a different game. Um, the Raiders also missed a – they had their pick six to start the game. They missed an extra point. You turn those two things around, the Raiders, that game never goes to overtime. So, again, it's one of those where John Gruden talked after the game saying, um, I can't be mad for winning games like these. It's like – because if one or two things go our way, we win this game by a landslide. So. Yeah, or one or two things go the Dolphins' way, more of the Dolphins' way, and you lose. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, when you're the Dolphins, too, on the road, you're up 14 nothing With a backup quarterback. You can't, like, you can't lose you should, those games. <laughs> yeah. But they did con- extend their streak, 25 straight games with a turnover. Yeah. Yeah, that's the... The longest, longest streak, active college. streak in the NFL yep. right now. Um, moving on to our afternoon games here. Um, another one of them. Uh, really the game of the week. Uh, Bucks on the road in L.A. Uh, Tom Brady, again, 400, 400 plus yards through the air. Uh, it's his, his first loss of his career where he went 400 plus yards, zero interceptions and lost the game um, in his career. So uh, their defense kind of struggled again. Their back end was banged up They're without. Um, if they had a B they win. He had no deep threat all game long. Yeah. It was a lot of, a lot of check downs. Um, That's all it was all game. Mm-hmm. Uh, ru- rushing the ball, who was it? Um, or not run it. Uh, Giovanni Bernard in the past game was kind of had had Tom's own touchdown on the day. <laughs> uh, nine for fifty one. Yeah, uh, but hats off to Stafford, three hundred forty three yards, four touchdowns. Mister uh, Deshaun Jackson, thirty four years old, three catches, one hundred and twenty yards on the day, aver- averaging forty yards a touch. And if you would have caught the um, other one that Stafford overthrew him by four yards, you'd have been four for 200. Two oh, touchdowns. yeah, yeah, yeah. We underthrew him because he was looking down the field and the ball wasn't there and it landed back behind him because he turns around and he's confused. Like, why well, everybody's, like, yelling at him. He's like, I did, I ran my route. Where's the ball? Um, but, again, Cooper Cup nine catches, just shy of 100 yards on the day. Him and Stafford looking like they've been doing this for 10-plus years with their connection this year. Um. Yeah, their the defense stu- stu- uh got stops when they needed to. Aaron Donald got his first sack against Tom Brady in his career. Um. Yeah, hats off to the Rams. Looking like the, I mean, they're three and zero, and they're well deserving to be the best team in that division right now. Yeah, shout out Stafford. He played tremendous. This West Coast offense um, that they have him in throwing the ball all over the field, it's clearly what they have to do um, to win as their ground game. They don't really have one. So it's either Matt Stafford in the air attack or nothing. That's how they're going to go this season. So it's going to be interesting. Obviously, I picked the Bucks to win um, without AB, without those two big boys on the D line, and you're missing a cor- couple corners. Your defense is a little banged up, so I ain't going to 
way to go Rams, I guess, for winning this with this game. It was a big game, but um, looking for the Bucks to bounce back. Uh, looking for them to bounce back. Their defense just didn't – no deep threat, which is Tom's favorite thing to do as of late, ever since he's been on the Bucks, is just fucking air the ball out. Maybe he's been there for them. Mm-hmm. Um, without that threat, you kind of lose your – big play scoring potential. You don't really have anything going down on the ground either. Um, as Brady was your leading rusher for 14 yards. Mm-hmm. So that's only the second time that's happened in his career where he's led the team for rush rushes. Yeah. The running back Jones had 11 yards and four and a half eight. So yeah, just look discombobulated Gronk exiting as well with with his hip who knows how serious that injury is going to be but if he's out that team's in trouble Mm -hmm. well he ended up coming back so he was able to play through it whether he went it back and they shot him with something to help with the pain to get him through the rest of the game but when he did come back he wasn't much of a threat as they were they're down pretty much 14 to 17 points the entire game Really, the final score was the closest it was, aside from the first quarter, um, when no points were scored at all. <laughs> uh, and then moving on to the last game of Sunday here, uh, the Seahawks head to town against the Vikings, who get their first win on the year, 30-17, uh, to 17, as um, Russell really going to get things going, taking a lot of deep shots, and that Vikings secondary stood the test. Um Kirk Cousins, again, kind of one of the unsung heroes this year. Three touchdowns on the day. Yeah, but because the Vikings are one and two, they're getting overlooked right now. Um, But probably the winner of that offense. uh, um, Dalvin Cook goes out. Alexander Madsen comes in. 26 touches for 112 yards on the ground yesterday. Uh, I feel like the Seahawks kind of wrote off that rush attack of the Vikings yesterday. Oh, Delvin Cook's out. They're going to put the ball in Kirk Cousins' hands. Well, guess what they did? And they had a ground game on top of it. So um, to, to hold Russell to only 17 points on the day, again, hats off to the Vikings, who, again, are only two plays away from being a 3-0 and team uh, in that NFC North. Uh, yeah, Seahawks falling behind in that NFC West going to be take a lot for them to come back right yeah, now that's that's two straight games have been blanked in the second half with no points titans and the minnesota vikings vikings looked good i i knew that this was going to be a turnaround game for them that's why i had them at home over the seattle seahawks because one seahawks don't look like the seahawks as of years of late um their defense is iffy russell's iffy um Whatever that whatever is going on over in Seattle, I think they just need to clean it up a little bit on offense. And man, when you're getting 300 yards thrown on you, what can you really do? I mean, Kirk picked them apart. He he played a phenomenal game, probably one of the greatest games of his career. Yeah, he looked he looked great again. He looked, he looked MVP like. And he he would have had fifty to hundred more yards, and I think another touchdown. But I think Phelan had a drop, and I think Jefferson had two drops on the day as well, um, which was uncharacteristic of both of those guys. But nonetheless, yeah, Vikings get the win uh, at home, which they really needed. Falling to zero and three at this point of the year, uh, again, really tough to come back from. And then the last game tonight, Eagles at Cowboys. Um, what do you got? Uh, what do I got here? Um, yeah, Eagles on the road, again, who have been kind of, uh, I guess, taking the league by surprise this year. I mean, I have it written off as being one of the worst teams in the league this year. Uh, Jalen Hurts is looking decent, but, um, I mean – Cowboys at Jerry's World. I think they get the win tonight. Dallas wins 34-21 uh, is the final I got. Dak's going to have another 400-plus game day. CeeDee Lamb, probably two touchdowns. I'm going Eagles 31-24. Sounds good. 
Um, uh, yeah. Mike McCarthy's gonna fucking get smacked in the mouth, and he's gonna be on the hot seat. Sounds good. Then wrapping up our NFL for the day. Then uh, moving over to the NBA here. Um, only point I have to mention is that Kyrie Irving misses his team uh, media day due to his vaccination status. Still not being vaccinated on that team. Uh, the NBA as a whole said that they are not requiring a vaccination among players. But given that Kyrie Irving playing for the Brooklyn Nets in the city of New York, any indoor arenas, you have to be vaccinated. Um, and kind of a hot take I watched this morning, uh, Stephen A. Smith basically t- saying that the uh, Nets should dish him out. You're going to ha- have a guy like that miss half of your home games. Um, again, with a big question mark on the team, if they can stay healthy, obviously they could be one of the best teams historically. Um, but when you have Kyrie Irving missing half of your home games, I mean – if you bake on him being a road warrior and winning you games on the road, maybe you keep him. but it's tough if he decides not to get vaccinated. Yeah. And no one knows if he's vaccinated or Knox vaccinated as he just refused to show proof saying that it's his private information, which I mean, any person has the right to do that. Um, he wants to keep all of, I, I watched an interview with him um, participating with the team media day from home on zoom uh, with fans or whatever. And somebody asked him the question, if he is vaccinated and he said, it's private information, I'm not going to discuss that with you. I have no idea who you are. And then another question was, are you going to be with the team this season playing at home? And he said, why basically he said why the fuck wouldn't i get the vaccine if that's ultimately what it's going to cost to be there playing home games at the end of the day ultimately he's got to do his job so yeah at at this point who knows if he is vaccinated or not he could be vaccinated and just didn't want to show proof proof of it because he why why do you have to you shouldn't have to do that to get and to be anywhere in the united states um as that's a pushback on, on you know on the vaccines so um it's going to be interesting to see. I don't, I don't see him missing any time. And if he does no big deal, that team's looking pretty good. As I saw a video of James Harden the other day, breaking out some new moves that he's got in store for the season. Some of those are pretty nasty. Um, and then my, I guess I have two little bits of news here. D book is missing the start of training camp due to health protocols. Obviously, COVID is being called into question. No one really knows what's going on. As I've seen him playing video games on Twitch the last couple of days, like 24-7. So I wonder if he is sick. Um, and Andrew Wiggins is denied his request for a religious exemption from COVID-19 vaccine, as I don't know how they can deny somebody that when he's saying that he's religious. Like... I don't understand. Yeah. I don't understand all that the the walk the line bullshit type of deal that all that stuff is. I mean, a common citizen would be granted that. Like if you're if your employer, like if you work for some corporation and you're like they want you to be vaccinated, oh, I don't I'm not gonna get the vaccination for this reason. Like they'd have and to you grant don't have that. To say, hey, right, and you don't have to say anything further than that. Yeah, they'd have to grant it. So how come he as an NBA player can't get it? Especially in the league where they said we're not going to require, but again, it is San, San Francisco. It's a city ordinance that they, or city mandate that they're forcing. So, uh, same in New York because the, their reports came out from the GM yesterday or two days ago that New York Knicks team is 100% fully vaccinated. So, yeah, seems messy where you got to. It's not one hoop you got to jump through. You got to jump through four or five to meet the expectations of your city, your team, your league, the government. You, like you got to <laughs> line all those things up, and every city's different, so every situation's different. It's just it's weird how they're handling this whole thing. What the fuck? Boston Celtics head coach Ime Udoka um, participated in the team's media day Monday through Zoom. Turns out he is vaccinated asymptomatic through all his 10 day quarantine, but they're still keeping him out. 
what the fuck <laughs> that's hilarious yeah it's just none of this makes sense. no they're just making up shit as they go at this point uh yeah then moving on to the mlb here for a couple things the brewers complete the weekend sweep over the mets and lock up the nl central uh with six games left to play they have an off day game or an off day today and then have a three-game series against the cardinals uh who keep their hot streak going sweeping the cubs over the weekend and moving to a franchise best 16 game win streak yeah, over a fucking drama-filled ending. Did you see any of that? From yesterday's game? Yeah, how the Cardinals ended up winning. I'm a, I, I don't remember. They ended up missing. They called an... Dude. So they called an infield fly, supposedly. And Cardinals, literally Cardinals thought they had a game-ending double play but there's no force out when they call infield fly. So they can't get the double play. So they ended up Ortega thought he was out and the game was over. So he walked off the base and got tagged for the double play. And that's how the game ended. Oh yeah. I didn't see that. Yeah. It was a fucking, it was a huge thing because they're supposed to call it out loud that infield fly and nobody did. And then yeah, they usually the double play and they ended up losing. <laughs> yeah. Usually the, the um the ump by second base usually the, i think the, like that's the call like they wave their hand in the air like this is like signaling an infield fly rule it's, and, yeah they, they put both hands up whichever one is closest first second or third base whichever umpire is closest is supposed to both hands up in the air and call infield fly so that everybody knows once his hands go up in the air that it's infield fly but yeah, it never happened and it ended up the Cardinals winning and continuing on their streak. <laughs> and then lastly here, uh, the Yankees sweep the Red Sox and move into the number one wild card spot um, in the AL. So the Yankees, again, kind of a roller coaster of a year, started super behind, got in a hot streak, went cold, went hot, and then uh, at a couple of weeks ago, they would went on another losing streak. Looked like they weren't going to make the playoffs, and then as of late again, they kind of ramped things up. So again, it's going to been a really up and down year for the Yankees. Uh, I guess it's going to be a matter if they can keep this hot streak going or if they're going to go cold here, start of the playoffs. But uh, yeah, that's all I got. Um, again, playoff baseball just a couple of weeks away. Still kind of w- w- uh, wide open on the AL side. Uh, for really the wild card spots on the NL side, things are pretty much pretty much locked up. Again, a team could win all their games, and the team ahead of them could lose all their games. So there's that possibility. But as things currently stand, I'm pulling it up here. Yeah, and the NL wild card, Dodgers have again so have a 13 game lead for the number one spot, and the the St. Louis Cardinals have a five and a half game lead over the Reds for the second spot. And again, with six to nine games to go, anywhere in there for all these teams that uh, for games that they have left, essentially the Cardinals, if they win one or two more games, they can lock up that second spot. But then on the AL side, it's still again wide open as. There's six teams, five teams within three games of each other, from the New York Yankees at the top uh, down to Oakland, who's behind three games, and then Seattle, Toronto, and Boston in between there as well. So um, going to be interesting coming down the stretch to see who claims those last spots. That's all I got for the MLB. Sounds good. Then let's take it over to the ice. Um, some of the most bizarre, one of the most bizarre things I've ever heard. Andre Deskinen is facing disciplinary action from the Ukrainian Hockey League after making a racist gesture toward an opponent. Toward opponent, um, this guy ended up scoring a goal, and he ended up making a racist gesture toward American-born defenseman Jalen Smerick, who is black. Um, the guy 
acted like he was unpeeling a banana and eating it, quote unquote, and making noises at the guy. Um, Lee came out and said that this is unacceptable. Racism has no place in the game of hockey, especially over here in this thing. The dude came out and said that he's not racist. He just let the his emotions get to him. He was super excited when he scored a goal, but still that makes no sense. That would drive you to do that um, straight to that type of person. So I'm expecting, I don't know, for him to maybe be suspended for the rest of the season, if not just barred from playing um, as that there's no place in any sports uh, for that type of action. Uh, Samaric, the 24 year old who it happened to, is a Detroit native and he is formerly a member of the Coyotes organization. This is his first season playing overseas. So, um, yeah, I guess shout out to the Ukrainian Hockey League for clamping down on this and taking taking action right away and not doing, you know, instead of sweeping it underneath the rug. <clears throat> Seattle Kraken opened their preseason with a 5 3 win over the Vancouver Canucks. Um, they looked, I guess you could say, pretty good. Um, the arena was fucking packed. I mean, what what more can you want from from your team and its opening game to end up winning? A, granted, it is the preseason; so half the teams don't even play the real guys. But a win's a win. Um, it's a good start for the fan base. You know, at least the fans gets the fans excited for what could potentially be an inaugural season. And they're looking to do what Vegas did. Um, going over really quick, some of the preseason scores that happened over the past 24 hours, sharks beat the Knights, Kraken beat the Canucks, ducks beat the sharks, Islanders over the Rangers, senators over the jets and OT Oilers over the flames. Um, the Canadians, I do believe, yep, Canadians and the Leafs played tonight, which gets me to my next point. Forward rookie Cole Caulfield will be out one week after suffering upper body injury during warm-ups um, before their last scrimmage of the year. Who knows how much actual time he's going to miss because he's listed day-to-day. Um, yeah, supposedly he's gotten a little bit bigger, a little bit faster. People are expecting him to score 40 goals on the year. And that's pretty much it coming out of the NHL right now. Um, preseason is getting underway, so the news is going to start ramping up here as teams are going to start making trades. Free agents are going to start getting signed. And, yeah, it's going to be a – I'm fucking super pumped for hockey to be back. Yeah, it's coming up fast. Uh, going over to college football here for a couple points. Um Notre Dame, hats off, embarrassed Wisconsin Saturday with a 41-13 win. Um, game was 13-10 to in the fourth quarter, and Notre Dame would put up 31 unanswered uh, to move on to 4-0 and for the year. Uh, rankings came out after all the games finished up uh, Saturday and yesterday, and after that win, Notre Dame moves up to nine. Wisconsin is now unranked. Um, another up or, or an upset that happened. Uh, NC State beats Clemson to hand them their second loss on the year. Clemson is now the 25th ranked team, so they just barely sneak into the top 25. And then the other upset of the week, Arkansas beats Texas A&M. Uh, Arkansas now sits at eight and Texas A&M falls to 15. Uh, the top four hasn't really mo- hasn't moved at all. So Alabama, Georgia, Oregon, Penn State are your top four teams. Um, and I think, yeah, Cincinnati moved up a spot to seven. Oklahoma and, went down two. Yep, uh, to six. And then Iowa stays put at number five. So, um, yeah, now that co- conference plays kicked off for a lot of these teams, uh, you're going to start to see some more, I guess, some better battles. As I know next, this coming week, Wisconsin plays Michigan. Our season's over. Yeah. So I, I don't even think I'm going to watch the Badgers, honestly, the rest of the year. Yeah. I'll kind of, <laughs> I'm not going to like go out of my way to sit down and watch them. But if it's like, 
close or if it's like it's i don't know i'll probably watch like the first quarter of each game and if it's like okay they're getting shit on then it's like all right i'm not gonna watch them and then maybe if they get a bowl game at the end of the year i'll watch that depending who they play but um at yeah, the same we got some good games this weekend yeah what are some of the games well, Wisconsin's on at 11, but I'm not watching that, like I stated. I'm going to be watching Arkansas-Georgia, 8 versus 2 at 11. Then you have Notre Dame, 7, or Notre Dame, 9, Cincinnati, 7 at 130, followed up by Mississippi, Ole Miss, 12, Alabama, 1. Yeah, definitely more games this week than last week that were in and another uh, ranked versus ranked matchup. Baylor, after they get the upset against Iowa State, they are now 21, playing Oklahoma State, um, who is 19. But otherwise, um, Indiana, Penn State, I mean, Indiana went toe-to-toe, has gone toe-to-toe with some good teams over the past year or so. Um, That could be an upset alert, depending on how the start of that game goes. Uh, Yeah, handful of good games to watch this coming week. And lastly, uh, for today, uh, the Ryder Cup, which was this weekend at Whistling Straits uh, here in Wisconsin, uh, USA wins 19-9, to which is the first double-digit win in the event since 1979. Um, really uh, a weekend that the U.S. Uh, dominated, hadn't lost any um, – any of the matches or like stroke play for sums, all the different uh, modes that they really played throughout this tournament. U.S. didn't drop a single, a single one. Uh, and it was funny to see afterwards when the team was celebrating with their trophy, uh, the team rallied around a hug between Kapka and DeChambeau as they try to put that feud to bed. Uh, so that was, that was fun to see. Yeah, and then before we uh, end the episode here, we have some breaking news coming out of the Kansas City Chiefs. They are set to sign Josh Gordon. Mm. So that's them loading up. I mean, I guess good for them. I think that they need more help on their defense than their offense. But Agreed, agreed. <laughs> but if, you, if your defense isn't going to get much better, what do you do? Score gotta, more points. <laughs> yeah, you gotta put a fifty and start winning games. Then. Yeah, that's but, basically what it seems like is their strategy. I mean, their defense. Yeah, I mean, really questionable so far, and their offense obviously is still really good. But it was the first time. This actually, yeah, this is the first time since Mahomes just came in where. They've faced adversity two weeks in a row at home, losing two games straight. Um, granted, he still played well. I mean, he's still Mahomes. You know yeah. what I mean? It's so, it's so sad for how good he started his career when he has 25 for 29, three touchdowns in the pick, 400 yards. That's a bad day for him. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, like that's sad that people have to really critique him way more difficult than I feel like every other quarterback in the league. Same with Lamar. It's like those two quarterbacks have mo- the most people talking the most shit about them all the time. Well, yeah. Once you win an MVP, you're, you're Mark. held on this pedestal. You're Mark. I mean, Leah Rogers too, reigning MVP shits to bed week one. People are still talking about it. Like, yeah, that'll be talked about all season long. Yeah. Like after winning last night, I'm pretty sure they asked like, like he was asked about it again in the press conference afterwards. It's like, and he has the same response. Week one was an anomaly. We moved, we've moved past it. It's like, I don't know. Again, it's the media just expecting him to say something different to get a rise out of him. But again, one of the most level-headed guys in the league. Good luck trying to get him to slip up, but. Yeah, looking around at the rest of the sports world, doesn't look like there's anything else that's really come out over the past hour and a half here. Um, Broncos yeah. lose wide out KJ Hamler for the season with the ACL tear as well. Yikes. Well, they're supposed to get Jerry Judy back soon, aren't they? 
couple like I think he was in a couple like, weeks. Yeah, I think they put him on the IR, so that's minimum three weeks. So I think he went on one, so he should be back week five, I believe. Yeah. Uh, sounds good then. Sounds good. Well, thank you everyone for stopping by. Don't forget to like, follow, subscribe. That button right down below. Um, liking the videos, commenting as well. We would love to hear you guys' feedback on our stuff, so don't forget to do that. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere and everywhere you can find podcasting platforms. Um, go ahead and search In a League of Their Own Podcast. Find us and make sure to give us five-star ratings. Help us move up the charts. Um, yeah. Can't really say a whole bunch more other than we appreciate all the love and support that we've been receiving continuously um, day in and day out from all you guys. And yeah, football season's back. We're all happy and we're all glad. Hope hope all your guys' teams ended up winning on Sunday or end up winning tonight. And we will be back on hump day. See you Wednesday.